conflict in paradise. Surfers Paradise Australia and the prize is the kart championship. With two races left, Gilda Perrin leads the championship by 19 points and could clinch the title today. But De Perrin struggles down under with an average finish of 15th in five races. A poor finish will tighten the battle. Contenders Paul Tracy and Michael Andretti, both Australia winners, are ready to pounce if De Perrin labors. Pacific coast of Australia, Surfer's Paradise is the site for round number 19 of the Kart FedEx Championship Series, the Kart Grand Prix of Australia. In the championship fight, there are now 681 miles, two races left, and a historic nine different contenders for the championship. Only one of those men, Jill DeFerrin, could in fact wrap the championship up today, but he must be very careful. A DNF here for DeFerrin would be disastrous. Hello and welcome, I'm Paul Page. This track at Surfers is a temporary street circuit with its walls and its rough pavement. It can absolutely destroy a championship fight in a matter of seconds. But perhaps the greatest problem of all for each of the nine contenders is that eight of them see this race as a desperate last possibility for a championship, Parker. And Paul, if the drivers finish the way they've lined up for today's race, Jill DeFerrin will be our new champion. DeFerrin's strategy, he has to be conservative. He can't make a mistake on the track, have anything go wrong in the pits, or have a mechanical problem. For the rest of the drivers, the only way to take on DeFerrin in the championship is to attack. And this place is brutal on equipment and drivers. Let's send you down to Gary Gerald. Paul, if there's a sleeper in this championship mix, it may well be the man in this pits. That's the defending series champion, Juan Montoya, who despite the fact that he had 10 DNFs early in the season, has come on with an absolute vengeance of late with a win and a second in the last two races. With absolutely nothing at stake this weekend, he's been attacking this street circuit with reckless abandon, as evidenced this video and a confrontation yesterday with Adrian Fernandez. Should anything happen to DeFerrin and he comes away without a point this weekend and Montoya continues this late season surge, Juan Montoya may again be in the middle of a championship season ending showdown two weeks from today. Paul? And by taking and by taking the poll, Montoya snatched that critical point away from Jill DeFerrin and did it in the last few seconds of qualifying. So now DeFerrin leads in the championship by 18 points with nine possible contenders. He's got to go away from here leading by at least four. Jan Bikas. Well Paul you talk about that championship lead you would think that Jill DeFerrin and the Penske team would be pretty relaxed. That has not been the case this weekend. You could cut the tension down here with a knife. They have come here on attack mode, as evidenced by the way that Gilles DeFerrin attacked the course during qualifying, trying desperately to get that single championship point. And I can tell you why. The reason the Penske team is so focused this weekend, they want to wrap up the championship now before they go on to the 500-mile race in Fontana, where we know anything can happen at that race distance. Now, you talk about tension. Gilles DeFerrin, right now, as they pass us on the front straightaway for the final warm-up lap, has Montoya to his left and Paul Tracy right behind. There's no bigger pressure cooker than that. So let's take a look at how they have qualified with two contenders on the front row, Juan Montoya on the pole, and Gilles DeFerrin will start outside. Dario Franchitti is inside a row three, and championship contender Paul Tracy on the outside. Two contenders in row three, Jimmy Vassar and Michael Andretti. In the fourth row, it's Tony Kanan and championship contender Elio Castro Neves. In the fifth row, Christian Fittipaldi and Cristiano D'Amata. The sixth row, Patrick Carpentier and Kenny Breck, who's a contender. In row seven, Alex Tagliani and Oriol Serbia. The eighth row, Max Pappas and Michelle Jordan Jr. In row nine, championship contender Fernandez and Mauricio Guzman. The tenth row, Alex Barron and the final of the nine contenders, Roberto Moreno. Row 11, Cindy Nakano and Mark Blundell. The 12th row is Tarso Marquez and rookie Jason Bright from right here at the Gold Coast in Australia. And the last row is Luis Garcia Jr. 181 miles, 65 laps, 22 to 26 laps for the fuel stop. There are four former winners in the field. And this is the second longest course on the FedEx Tour. It's also very, very fast. In four different sections, the driver's meter exceed 180 miles an hour. Principal passing area, heading down into turn one. Also look for passing opportunities in turn three, also in turn five. Keep in mind, this track is heavily crowned. At every single exit, the drivers are thrown off camber towards the concrete wall.
Looking through some of the onboard cameras that we have for you, of course, Mark Blundell, who will start well back, but this may give us some great opportunities uh, to see some of the potential problems that you have on this circuit. The look back from Montoya. Jill DeFerrin, carrying number two for Roger Penske, hopes that this day goes so smoothly and ends up with his first championship, and certainly the Penske team is looking for the same thing, but because, again, of the circuit, which is so, so very difficult, and as you see there, so very, very tight, well, anything can happen at any second that can end the championship, and it's not unknown for them to have uh, accidents that result in course blockages here, so all of those things loom. And foremost on DeFerrin and Team Penske's mind is padding their championship points lead with an additional four points to come out of here with the championship lead. But for now, DeFerrin's got to think about having Montoya directly next to him and Team Green. All Gilles DeFerrin wants to do is get through the opening lap unscathed. Everybody else, they're going to take this opportunity to try to make a pass and move up in that championship fight. As they come onto the pit straight, the field comes into order. Montoya slightly ahead of Gilles DeFerrin on the outside. The green flag comes out. Paul Tracy looks to make a move early. He sweeps across the inside, and Montoya gets in trouble. Montoya gets in trouble. And does he damage the Farron? It looks like he does. It looks like the Farron's got a broken right front. And if he does, then we, yes, he definitely does. And the championship goes on to Fontana on this very first corner. Not really like we normally see from Montoya. Full course caution to the field. Montoya gets it sideways. Of course, we're going to have more opportunity to analyze the whole thing. Montoya is out of the car, but the Farron is in trouble. And I was very surprised just as we cut away from that overhead shot as the green came out, you could see DeFerrin trying to take Montoya on the outside going into that first chicane. I would have thought Paul DeFerrin would have dropped back, slotted in behind Montoya and simply tried to lead the two team green cars down into that chicane. That is everything. That's exactly what you don't want to have happen. Montoya just flat loses it, while at the same time Tracy is trying to make a move following up Montoya, and DeFerrin gets into the melee and breaks the right front as a minimal piece of damage. It was hard to tell from that angle, but it looked like, well, you could see the contact there, first with DeFerrin to the right, maybe a little bit with Tracy from behind. We'll have to take another look at that. And Franchitti spinning, something that we didn't see earlier. Both Carpentier and Jimmy Vassar decide to shortcut the chicane to stay away from it all. Franchitti is off to the left here. So we'll try and check on his condition. Moreno also shortcuts. Okay, at this point you can see Montoya clearly has the inside. He moves over for a little protection. Watch DeFerrin on the outside continue to try to go deeper under brake. Well, they're still under acceleration, but under braking here. This is what I saw just before we cut away. And it looks to me, Paul, like he may have gotten hit by Tracy, which then turned him into DeFerrin. And then you can see the multiple contact through there as Michael then squeezes through between Vassar and Montoya. So we talked about the uh, possibility of problems here at Surfer's Paradise, the typical issues of a street circuit where the walls are only inches away all the way around. There they are, there is the championship, and it goes on. Here's another way to look at it. I'm still surprised that Jill would attempt to try to take Montoya. Well, that joined a little bit late. Yeah, we can't tell if it was already hit there. We can see, obviously, where the damage came from DeFerrin as he went and clouded the back of Montoya's car. Everyone else in full avoidance mode. Some great driving there by Cristiano D'Amata and also by Elio Castroneves. And one of the thing about the about those dotted lines, there are the curbs there. Here is it from well, Montoya. Well, he was just obviously hit there. There's no doubt about it. That wasn't Montoya locking up the rears on corner entry. He simply got punted on the way into the chicane. As you see, the, the curbs are beneath Montoya right now. And those are actually pretty stout. And those guys that passed over them could have some damage and not even see it until they get back and come on the front straight where the crews can look at them. Well, it looks like the sequence of events there was DeFerrin touching Montoya, Tracy then getting into the back of Montoya after that initial contact, and everyone else just scrambling for their lives at this point. I thought it was very heads up of Montoya to come off the steering wheel. So we watched from his onboard, wait till the steering wheel had settled down so he didn't injure his hands or arms, then re-grab it, but unfortunately had no left front to continue and try to steer out of the way of 
the resulting mess. And three of the contenders involved in that. The question is going to be that car, the green and white car of Paul Tracy, whether or not he suffered anything that it might rear its head here shortly. You can be assured the team's going to look all over that car, but as you see them line back up, Tracy will lead Andretti and Vassar. Those are all three contenders. Then Canaan, Demata, Carpentier, and Elio Castroneves, another contender down at eight, followed by Servia and Tagliani. That rounds out the top ten. Well, we were looking at some of the statistics last night. Gary mentioned Montoya's DNFs at the opening of the show, and he's formed a pattern so, for, so far this year, completely out of his control. He's had three DNFs, then he completes three races, three DNFs, and this has gone on all season. Well, with the last race at Houston, he had just completed his third race. We were talking about it last night, and looking at the statistical analysis, this would be the first of at least two DNFs as we complete the season for Juan Montoya. Jill DeFerrin comes all the way through the pit area down to the very last pit, the Penske pit. And my assumption, I would think that they will try and repair it. Well, certainly they will. We've seen in the past strange things here happen at Surfers. A lot of cars end up falling out, especially in the waiting laps of the race. They're going to try to get that car back on board and get him back out. Watch my toy now. This'll this'll be it right here, Paul. Oh, he got clouded on the way into the chicane. Let's go to Jan Bikas. Well, Chip Ganassi has seen those same replays. What's your take on the accident, Chip? I don't know. I mean, Juan just said he got hit from behind. Uh, you saw what I saw. I've seen your excitement this weekend. You truly thought you had a championship chance here, didn't you? Well, I mean, we thought, you know, we, we thought we had some wins left in us. And, uh, you know, we, we, it's been one of those years where we've been plenty fast and we've led a bunch of races and, you know, we finally got everything working the way we wanted it to work. And I think we had a chance to win today, and it's obviously a huge disappointment what happened down there in turn one. Thank you, Chip. Let's check in with Gary. And right behind you, Juan has made his way back. What was your plan going into the first chicane at the start of this race? Just lead, you know, very simple. They told us to do a smooth start. I did that. Everybody was packed up, and I don't know exactly what happened. So, you know, I think, you know, Jill was very fast down the straight, even when before him. I break later than him. I was the downshift and so I fell at something hitting him in the back. So it's a shame, you know, the car has been fantastic all weekend, you know. Everybody here in Target and Toyota worked, you know, basically as hard as they could to make everything work fine. And With the momentum that you had in the last two races, did you think coming into this race today that you still had a chance of yeah. defending your championship? Definitely, you know. If Jill had had a bad race, I would have won, we would be 10 points behind and last Last year I was seven points behind and I won, so it was a good chance. Now everything's over. Thank you. And that's absolutely correct. As we see Jill DeFerrin looking at his car and making a determination as what the team can, if anything, do for him. Of the group, Juan Montoya now certainly out of the battle for the championship, and without question, the championship goes on to the final race of the season in two weeks at California. ESPN's coverage of the CART Grand Prix of Australia is brought to you by FedEx, proud sponsor of the FedEx Championship Series, by Volvo, Volvo for life, and by Budweiser, with the crisp, clean, refreshing taste you'll find in no other beer. This Bud's for you. Jim Swintel, the starter, has just given the field uh, an indication of one lap to go until they go green. They work feverishly on Jill DeFerrin's car. And the lineup was Tracy Andretti, Vassar Canaan, Fittipaldi, Damata, Carpentier, Castro Neves, Servia, and Tagliani. Jan Bikas. Jill DeFerrin is out of his car. He has the helmet on. He now, for the first time, has just explained the situation to Roger Penske. He sat here for a minute or two before he even spoke with anyone, anyone on the crew. He knows that the chances of clinching a championship are gone for this race. And now he just sits and waits as the crew does. And this will be a very lengthy repair, by the way, Paul. This will be very long, but he is hoping that maybe with attrition today, there's some maybe slim chance of getting one or two championship points. Gary Gerald. And with Dario Franchitti, you've just now had an opportunity to watch a sequence of replays. Dario, what can you tell us from your second row starting position as to happen? Well, I think I need some more replays to figure it out. I mean, it's, there's a lot of stuff going on there. Um, what I saw was, was um, Juan and Gilles getting together. You know, Juan made a perfect start. This is the kind of start that the guys from CART wanted him to make. A nice, consistent build-up. Past couple of starts have been like that, and we've had problems both, both times, so maybe it's not working. But 
Juan made a good start. Him and Gilles got close in the first corner. Um, I guess, I mean, from that point, I can't say. I saw Juan going into a spin. I backed up, got on the brakes, and um, I guess Jimmy had nowhere to go and hit me. You know, he was... Everybody was, was pretty much checking up for the incident in front. Um, and yet again, we're the ones that get caught out. So, uh, how, how worried were you about this happening on the start of this race? I was pretty worried about it. You know, Paul was, was weaving around. Paul was being very aggressive, as usual. Um, didn't give me much room as he cut across the front. But that, that wasn't anything to do with the incident. Um, this is just unfortunate. I mean, it's, it's tough. Thank you. We're about to go green. Paul? I think the point's well taken that they did bring them down to the flag, and the drivers have been discussing this constantly. They brought them down to the flag properly, but as one would expect here with a championship on the line, we saw some very aggressive movement. Well, we certainly saw that from Paul Tracy. Montoya with a great start, as Dario said. Amazing to me that Jill DeFerrin was able to outpower him all the way down the straightaway going into the outside of that first corner. Unfortunately, we're missing about two or three frames of critical information to see exactly what triggered that incident. But as Dario said, whatever it was, there was an awful lot going on there. The Ferrans Championship hopes for today, anyway, are over. They will come back to the flag single file, led by Tracy, then Andretti Vassar, and Tony Canaan. No indication from Team Green as to whether or not, with all of that uh, contact, there's any problems for Paul Tracy. They certainly have not brought the car in. And the green flag is out. Here we go again. It's the start of the fourth lap. Boy, Tracy got a big jump on the start. Down through the first chicane, Michael Andretti in pursuit. There's Jimmy Vassar. This time, the whole field safely through. Now to the second chicane, critical passing area coming up. Got a glimpse of Elio Castro Nevis, the second Penske car, who as a result of the accident got pushed well back. Gary Gerald, what about Paul Tracy? Well, we just checked with Barry Green, and he says Paul reported absolutely no contact. Now, I don't know if that's contrary to what you've seen in your replays or not. We haven't had the luxury of seeing those, Paul. But uh, they seem not to be concerned at all, and I think everything is all right now as we're back under Green and Tracy's out in front. Well, Jimmy Vassar just had to take a jump uh, right through the middle of the chicane. We're trying to get a good look at Paul Tracy's car. Uh, I haven't seen anything that really shows contact. No uh, giant black marks on the nose. Certainly nothing. nothing else that would indicate it, Jan. Yes, stepping back to Gilles DeFerrin, I was just told by the Penske team that this repair now, they are estimating to be a 15 to 20 minute job. So basically, if they don't have a whole lot of more people fall out of this race, it may be for nothing. You got a glimpse too of Jimmy Vassar and damage on the front wing on the right side. And we saw that there, and also looked like he had something wrapped around that leading edge, certainly dangling below, below the uh, main plane there. And it's those few frames that were missing on that starting incident that would tell us if it was DeFerrin and Montoya without Tracy's help that caused that entire incident, or if Paul was involved as well. But we saw one shot there, Paul, where it looked like Tracy may have been about a half a car length back and, in fact, not been involved in that incident at all. Now back at third place, Tony Kanaan is working hard on Jimmy Vassar, has the rest of the field lined up behind him. Fittipaldi to Monte Carpentier. Tracy's managed to pull away. Not unexpected. One given what he feels is necessary to accomplish if he is going to go on to his first championship. And the fact that he came back to the restart. Look at the, look at the lead there. That's 3.3 seconds on this track. Michael, though, is in hot pursuit. Now Fittipaldi works on Tony Canaan. Both Canaan and Fittipaldi climb on the curbs. And entering the back section of this course, turns 8 through 11 are the only sections of the course that don't have line of sight. It's traditional concrete walls right to the asphalt. Now, the drivers also have a problem as the day goes on. They're going in and out of the shadows, looking directly into the sun as they go through that back section. You can see some of the glare off the camera shot there. Yeah, there you saw really one of the only areas where they've really been able to open it up. They made a minor modification to turn 9, which gave about 
two feet more visibility of the drivers as they made the left hand turn into nine. That's the pit straight down into the first chicane first turn. And on that lap Paul Tracy's now pulled out 5.6 seconds over Michael Andretti. Keep in mind Paul won back here in 1995 and who was his teammate at the time. Uh, somebody sitting near me. No absolutely <laughs> not. It was, it was Michael Andretti. That Newman Haas at the time who's currently in second place but Paul Tracy is just checked out. They'll be back as teammates next year kind of. Well technical partners. All right, let's go back down to Gary Darrell. As far as Michael Andretti is concerned, in the morning warm-up of a half hour, they only got five or six laps and had an oil leak develop. Peter Gibbons told us as they were making repairs after that session, it was not a major problem. But what it did do for Michael was deny him an opportunity to make sure that everything in the car was set the way he'd want it for race conditions. But also, I think, guys running under the highest uh, ambient temperature that we've had thus far this weekend ideal conditions but all in all that may be hurting Michael a little bit in the early going as he's fallen five six seconds off the pace they didn't have the, uh, the normal period of time that they would have had owing to the fact that it was a typical tropical day on Friday here with some rain shower activity going through the area and that affected the first qualifying and the morning practice as well in fact uh, for a long time no one wanted to go out and test the walls on the practice sessions and yesterday temperatures went up into the 80s with bright sunshine but very very strong winds east to west crosswinds fit a quality works can on Boy, you and can still see working him. Oh, Canon locks him up and drops in behind Fittipaldi. Good move for Christian. That was quite the drag race. You could see Ford Power versus Mercedes there. Christian got a good run coming off the corner onto the pit straightaway. Drafted up behind Tony and just motored on by. Tony not giving up, breaking very late into that chicane. And now Cristiano Damata all over the back of Tony Canon. Damata, that little pit bull who just, you know, 127 pounds with driver's suit and perspiration. And he's not what you want behind you anywhere. The rumors about him still go on. No official announcements of where he is going to drive next year. We saw behind that fight in that last corner, Castro Neves and Oriol Serbia were side by side. Castro Neves starts out, but he's not close enough to Serbia to make the move. At the same time, Elio Castro Neves very disappointed with his qualifying efforts. He said every time he started to come up, to perfect timing on the tires, putting in a good lap, it would go red flag. Frustration felt by a lot of the drivers this weekend. The course is so long, you've got to hit it just right. Castro Neves says, I've got a car, I can get to the front. I'm going to say with Castro Neves, right behind him is Alex Tagliani. And with that one move, it cost Castro Neves a little bit. And Tagliani came right up to attack. The famous koala bear of Australia, nocturnal, that sleeps about 23 hours a day. We'll be back. Later NASCAR Winston Cup from Talladega. The Winston 500. Bobby Labonte points leader is going to start six. Nemechek is on the pole with Billy Elliott going to start alongside. Back at Surfers Paradise, Australia. The view is Christian Fittipaldi. As he's up now to try to work on Jimmy Vassar. Vassar is currently third. You got a glimpse of Michael Andretti. Vassar, Andretti, Tracy, the top three with Tracy leading it and all three of those contenders in the championship battle. Since we went away, no changes on the track at all. Crowd here, cart reporting a record crowd for a cart event over 250,000 over the time of the event. The Australians approach their spectatorship, if that's a word, of the viewing of these races a little bit differently than elsewhere in the world. They love to walk the circuit constantly. In fact, some grandstands are just set so that you can, in fact, do that. No reserved seating. You can walk place to place, one corner for 10 minutes, go further, walk the entire circuit by the time the day's over. Those early laps of yellow, the drivers aren't concerned about fuel. 
The math is simple. You just have to go to lap 22, do that one more time, and you get to the end. Two-stop race. From what we've heard over the radio, most of the drivers have it up on full rich, full power. And you can see Paul continue to extend that gap over Michael Andre. Tracy used to talk about getting into the zone. He's got to be in the zone now. Last time across the line, he extended again another tenth, his lead over Michael Andretti. Christian Fittipaldi, remember back in 1997, had that opening lap accident with oh, Gilles yeah. Deferrin? Missed seven races, broke his leg fairly severely. But you can see in certain sections of this course, Jimmy Vassar comes off that quick back chicane very fast. He comes onto the pit straightaway very fast. The one place where Christian is much quicker is off of turn four, coming onto that short back shoot. Christian's got to really concentrate on getting through this section out of turn 12 well so that he can stay right up behind Jimmy through the first two chicanes to really maximize that advantage coming onto that back shoot to try to get that pass done down into turn five. You know, that accident involving Christian speaks volumes about the stamina and the perseverance of the race car driver. That might have been uh, crutches today for the likes of uh, any, any civilian. But not only did he come back from it and come back to win it eventually his first champ car race, but he's also a triathlete and loves, loves to run. I mean, he's an incredible athlete. The thing that was amazing is his, his leg was badly broken. Oh, oh, what is this? Paul Tracy. He is off and he has stalled the engine. That certainly has to be down in one of the runoffs. Yes, it is. First report coming in is what? Throttle stuck on the car and he just had to shut it down? Well, keep in mind, these cars have software that will automatically shut the throttle down if it senses that they get to the point that they should be in the braking area. The driver has released pressure from the throttle, is on the brake, and it's not decelerating. The engine management system will shut the car down. And because of his positioning, they do go to the full course caution. Pace car will come out. It's going to be a full course yellow, but keep going, keep going. And he just ran right off. It looked like he was trying to get on the brakes and get the car stopped, which he eventually did, of course. That'll open the pits, and that'll bring, I would suspect, everyone in the field, with the possible exception of Roberto Moreno, in for fuel and tires. Now, 11th lap. Now, the problem they have is that if he has shut the engine off or it has been shut off by the engine management system, if they got get this thing restarted, it's going to restart wide open throttle if it's a mechanical problem. He's going to have to then figure out how to toggle the ignition to get the thing back to the pit lane to get that problem fixed, or it may clear itself and they'll have to reboot the system. We can see everyone coming into the pits. One of the contenders is in, Fernandez, Roberto Moreno's teammate, comes in. They're going to bring Roberto Moreno in as well, so any advantage that they had hoped for there goes away with this full course caution. Kenny Breck is already back into the fight. Jan Vigas. Michael Andretti has a communication problem right now. Obviously, it's very important that he understands the crew. They want him here on pit road. He cannot hear the team at the moment. Roberto Moreno, they got Paul Tracy running. Roberto Moreno, as he started his turn into the pit, Alex Barron roared out. Moreno had to jump all over the brakes, actually stop the car, got the car in a very awkward position, but they were able to refuel it and get it back on its way. But Paul Tracy got it started without incident and is now coming back into the fight. Gary Gerald, do they have any idea what happened? Can you tell us what happened, Kim? We heard a report of a possible throttle linkage problem or sticking Well, up. He's, uh, he certainly went into a braking area and, and hard under brakes and the throttle stuck wide open. So uh, he had a bit of a panic situation. Uh, the throttle appears to be OK now, so it's probably something electronic. Uh, we're going to fire him up. We've got him fired back up, get him back in here and try and get back in this thing because the car was fantastic up until that point. All right, thank you, Kim. Jan? Gary, we talked about Michael Andretti and the radio problem. It turns out it was even more crucial than we thought. They desperately wanted him to come on pit road for service. He could not hear, so therefore he missed the opportunity to come onto pit road. Now they have to change their strategy. They've told him to change the fuel map to stay out, and they'll hope for another opportunity later on. So the second full course caution of the day at Surfers Paradise Australia, the Kart Grand Prix of Australia. And once again, the whole mode of the championship alters. Paul Tracy stops on course, but does in fact 
get three started. This Toyota Spotlight focuses on Paul Tracy at Laguna Seca late in the race. Tracy battled with Oriole Servia for eighth position. On the last lap, Tracy tried to pass Servia. He broke too late. And then he spun, losing three positions to Jimmy Vassar, Carpanti, and Christian Fittipaldi. The spin cost Tracy three valuable championship points. Tracy trailed to Farron by 19 heading into the race here in Australia. Now only time will tell how that affects the championship. Gary? After Paul Tracy got restarted, he spent a lap chasing the field, still under caution to catch up with him, then ducked into the pits. We anticipate the field goes green next time they cross the start line. And Tracy came in, got routine service, tires, fuel, nine and a half seconds, back out to the back of the pack. But the lingering concern is whether or not that throttle that apparently hung up once may do it again. John? In regards to Jimmy Vassar, he also did not pit along with Michael Andretti simply because he didn't see Michael go in. Why should he? That is a common strategy to follow what the leader is doing. However, of course, they were not aware that Michael Andretti had lost his radio communication and they wanted him on pit road. So now Vassar is quite concerned about his fuel time. Interesting stuff that you saw for Max Pappas. And here's Blundell, a small argument with where he wants, uh, who is that, Sinji? Yeah, Sinji alongside there. So we'll come back to green here shortly. Pappas says he came out alongside of Guzman's car, really twisted it around and just barely nicked the back, uh, the back end up against one of the tires laying there during the tire chain. Andretti, Vassar, Fittipaldi, Canon, Damata. Tracy's going to be the real question. Green flag comes out. Andretti nails it. Tracy will take the green flag in 21st position on the leader lap. Looking up track and looking for Tracy. Coverage here, of course, provided by the host broadcaster. 10 Australia. Look at there. Already he's showing up. He just comes around. The Australian from the Gold Coast, Jason Bright, makes his first champ car start coming up out of the light series. Now Tracy on the move. Gary Gerald. All back in the paddock area behind the pits, the crew for Michael Andretti is scrambling, trying to create possible message boards. They're ripping signage down from the fences inside the garage. They're quickly taping it as quickly as they can onto these boards. They're going to race it out to the pit road so that they can communicate with their driver when he flashes by the pits. Well, that's inventiveness. Tracy up behind Moreno. Moreno, of course, one of the contenders. Moreno is 19th. on qualifying an earlier performance, Tracy is decidedly faster than anyone immediately in front of him. At the same time, what does he think about that throttle? Tracy, with his, uh, his ability to just blank his mind and focus on the racing, wash that away, or is that going to sit there and nag him? Well, it's definitely a concern. If you don't know what caused it and you don't know why it's working now, it will gnaw on the back of your mind, but Paul Tracy, steely-eyed missile rocket man here. It doesn't look like he has any fear at all. He is the poster boy for no fear. And now going down the inside of Moreno. Remember, we showed you Max Pappas as he came out of the pits touching a tire. And now they're going to give him the black flag for that. Pit safety violation. Jan Vikas. Bill DeFerrin has taken his helmet off. I assume this means now that the repair cannot be done. Yeah, it's uh, too much stuff to do, and um, unfortunately, that there's really not enough uh, time to do it properly, I think. The important question is, what happened down there in the first turn? Uh, it was a shame, uh, really. I mean, I had a, I had a good start, and uh, I was kind of half a car ahead of uh, Juan going into the braking area, but really not enough, I thought, to really do a, a dive on the braking. So I braked a little bit early, to, you know, to let him uh, set himself up uh, into the corner. 
and uh, I was just got squeezed between him and the, and the wall. And as as we were finishing the break in there, he uh, his right rear collected my left front. I, I really couldn't you know couldn't break anymore. I was really almost trying to get out of his way, and um, I don't know if it just somebody hit him from behind or he just squeezed a little bit, misjudged it a little bit and squeezed a little bit too much to the right. One of those unfortunate racing accidents, I guess. Now, I know you were so focused on the championship here, you wanted to wrap it up. What does this now do to that situation? Uh, it's obviously very unfortunate. I mean, uh, we now depend uh, on uh, to see what happens with our main competitors to, to, to see what we're going to have to do in Fontana. So, uh, very unfortunate that we cannot have uh, the de our destiny in our own hands at this point, but uh, it's racing. Thank you, Chef. No problem. Well, you notice that Bob's figured it out. Roberto Moreno, after Tracy came through, Moreno said, okay, I'm just going to lock onto him. You're looking back for Mark Blundell as Tracy closes in. Tracy is currently 17th, but here's that one pass. Comes inside Mauricio Guzelman, locks it up a little bit. It's difficult there as you cross the crown of the road going offline. And you can see Moreno, as you said, right behind him saying, well, that looks like a good idea. I think I'll give it a try. I'll just lasso that green and white car and stay right with him. He's going through, I'm going too. I mean, we're watching Paul Tracy come up through the field. You'd think this guy's dead last. He's now come up to 17th position, but Paul, of all the drivers on this circuit, remember Paul came from 17th to first at Long Beach this year. He was, for all intents and purposes, dead last after the opening lap at Elkhart Lake and drove absolutely a brilliant race to win there. Reminds me of the race with Zanardi back at Long Beach a few years ago when he came out of the pits right in front of Gilles de Ferran, almost going a lap down, coming back to win. For almost any other driver, they'd be thinking, how do I get back to the points? For Paul Tracy, he's thinking 17th, I've got a lot of time. There are opportunities to pass here. I have a great car. I can still win this thing. And he, in fact, is better under pressure. This is, uh, though he probably wouldn't have witched it on himself, where he tends to perform at his best. Andretti has just about an eight-tenth, less than a second lead over second place, Jimmy Vassar, followed by Fittipaldi, Tony Kanan, Damata, Servia, Carpentier, Catherine Evans, Michelle Jourdain Jr. with a good run is in ninth place, and Tarso Marquez sits in tenth. But part of that owing to the fuel strategy. Look at the beautiful surfers, paradise, Australia, and the marinas. It's a place that the drivers of the champ cars and their teams love to come. Surfers Paradise Australia, the land down under on the Pacific coast of Australia. Since we have left you, nothing has changed. Michael has edged down a little bit over Jimmy Vassar, 1.3 seconds now. Paul Tracy continues to try to work the field as uh, you saw him go around Mark Blundell and move into 16th place. He's not moved up since that point. He's obviously playing it very, very careful. Michael Andretti's already had two mechanical problems during the course of the weekend. He broke a transmission, also had a throttle cable fail. You can see how rough this course is. It's not helped by the fact that most of the drivers jump the curbs as well. So Michael's got to take care of this car in order to stay in the championship fight. But he knows that Paul Tracy is coming through this field, turning the race's fastest laps, lap after lap. There's the back stretch down the Esplanade. Runs parallel to the beaches here at Surfers. Focus on the battle for second place, Vassar and Fittipaldi. You know, Paul, we've talked a lot about the Drivers Championship. We haven't talked about the Manufacturers Championship. Coming into this weekend, only three points separated Ford, Cosworth, and Honda, 293 to 290. Looked at the beginning of this race, looked at the grid, the top five cars, Toyotas and Hondas, but very quickly with the elimination of Montoya, Look at the elimination of Frank Kitty, Tracy dropping back. Now we've got Ford Toyota with Vassar, another Ford with Fittipaldi, and then Mercedes with Canaan. Great run by that team. And also Cristiano D'Amata in his Toyota-powered car in fifth place. Starts to change the complexion of the Manufacturers Championship during the course of the surfers race. You know, a lot of people are asking 
there was such a focus on the silly season for a while there and you expected all kinds of stuff to happen and then it just all stopped why did it stop well for the most part it stopped because suddenly mercedes says we're not in the series next year those engines are not going to be available and so now everybody had to rethink what they were doing and the seats have suddenly gotten a little more scarce there are also several drivers that haven't been committed yet officially to a team until those drivers move and the engine manufacturers may or may not move with them everything has just been put on hold the report is about two and a half laps. Michael Andretti should be coming into the pits. Don't forget the communication problem. The jury rigged board to help Michael and communicate with him. But think how critical that can be. This is a very long circuit, nearly three miles around. And you can't miss that fuel stop at all. It's not like you're gonna be able to coast in because you missed one. You can see Cristiano D'Amata there getting around the inside of Tony Kanaan. Now Cristiano's teammate, Oriel Servia, looking for a way around Kanaan. Cristiano has been trying to set him up, coming off that back straightaway, lap after lap after lap. Finally got a great run out of the back chicane. Got him under braking for turn number seven. Serbia tucks in, working Kanan. Kanan is one of those who uh, now has apparently the uh, confidence that he is fine for next year with Morris Dunn Racing. And Monon's talking about a second car for that group. Carpentier started to make a move to the inside of Serbia. He's there. And right behind him, there's Castro Nevis and Jordan Jr. Carpante, one of the drivers, not sure where he may or may not drive. We'll take a, a replay here. Coming out of seven, Damata gets a great run, looks down on the inside, going into turn eight. Tony knows that he's got the corner, doesn't try to put a wheel underneath him, knows that this is a long race, a lot can happen. Let's him through there. Oriel Servia tries to get in there as well. I'm trying to figure out how I can make a joke out of the words Tony knows. Okay, so anyway, we're talking about <laughs> Carpentier. He's had some great performances recently. Talked to him the last few days. He said things are looking better for next year. He's got a couple of different opportunities. Doesn't know where he might find that ride, but he's fairly confident he will be back next year in the series. Tony Kanan, uh, maybe with the greatest sense of humor of any of the drivers in the series. Uh, for a long while, everybody was hesitant to uh, mention to him the fact that he has a uh, uh, Jimmy Durante kind of schnoz going for him there. And his nickname? Is, well, the one that he won't answer to is Rudder. But then he finally did, uh, did a little television feature on himself, and of course, we all decided it was instantly fair game to go right after him. He's a great guy, though. Ready now, just two seconds ahead. And next time by is a guess for Andretti. From our location, we can't see that jury rig board. We can assure you that Gary and Jan are keeping track of everything that goes on down there. Now Most let's say we're trying, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you, Paul, that Tony Kanan's crew has laid out. Michael's has not. When you hear on the scanners, pit two, it goes two, one, and then pit. So there's actually one additional lap in those radio communications before they hit the pit road. You just saw in replay that uh, Paul Tracy is continuing to nibble his way forward. That was a move around Tony, or uh, excuse me, uh, Sinji Nakano for 16th, putting Tracy now in 15th. And you can see Nakano took him very, very deep into that corner. Paul had to lock up the brakes to a couple of tank slappers on the way in, but got the pass done with the leader, Michael Andretti. Here, Michael lock up the tires there. That's something you don't often hear from racing slicks is a squeal. Michael Andretti, one of the former winners in the field. Remember that great run? Taking, uh, taking Swift to its first victory. And remember, Michael Andretti gave Bernard its first victory here back in 1994 on his return from Formula One. Drove us off when you enter the pit lane. So Michael Andretti, one more lap to go, and he will be in, assuming, of course, that all that communication is going well. Can Michael Andretti do in? He will come in on the race's 24th lap. See whether or not Vassar and Fittipaldi will do as well. Look at the beautiful beach.
Speaker Stereo, just one of over 40 features now standard on the Volkswagen Golf. Thank you very much, Mr. Robot, for helping me to get this when I need it to. Thank you, Mr. Robot. Back at Surface Paradise, Australia, waiting for Michael Andretti to head for the pits. Teams laid out for... Michelle Jourdain, the PPI team of Cal Wells. Uh, uh, Cal Wells is laid out for both Oriol Servi and Cristiano D'Amata. Michael Andretti's on the pit road. He flips his visor high, and Gary, you wait for him. Tim Coffin, who wears the helmet cam, will be at the right front, waves him into position. Here's Michael. We still don't know if he can hear Kenny Seawick on the radio talking to him. First set of Firestones being changed for the day. That's complete. Waiting for the fuel. Revs come up, Michael rolls, we've got him at 12 seconds flat. His teammate, Christian Fittipaldi, right behind him, is right out in sequence. For those two, it's routine. Tarso Marquez, you'll see him go by there. Cristiano D'Amata is underway. So is Oriol Servia, so is Michelle Jourdain Jr. So Michael Andretti relinquishes the lead, Jimmy Vassar picks it up stop on the 24th lap at Surfers Paradise. Remember, it was only a couple weeks ago we saw Jimmy drive that great race at Houston, won Toyota's first street course victory. And it had been a long time since Jimmy had been on top of the winner's podium, back to 98 at Fontana. Very, very, very rarely ever makes a mistake. One of those drivers, the more pressure that's on him, the better that he performs. Best line of the weekend is he just wanted to give Juan Montoya a going away present before he's off to Formula One. Now Tracy drops it down to the speed limit. Or excuse me, Jimmy Vassar brings it down to the speed limit. Paul Tracy has managed to work his way now up to 12th. Jan Vikas. Yes, we wait for Jimmy Vassar. We've seen a 12-second stop for Michael, 11.8 for Kanan. We'll see what this target Ganassi team can do. Now, he certainly has damage on the left front wing. He's made some contact with someone, and I would imagine because of that, that's why they're adding front wing on the right side and took it out on the left. A little bit slow to get it back in gear, but still under 12 seconds for Vassar. Left front to Jan, right front to Jimmy Vassar. And the field comes by. And Vassar slots in ahead of Roberto, who is going to try to get around him. And Jimmy's, with those fresh tires, going to have to tiptoe to keep that car ahead of Roberto Moreno. We could see a little bit of contact as they came into that second chicane. Jimmy just has to drive, oh, he's, he's giving it to him now. I thought he was gonna drive down the inside there, continuing to try to be, build uh, tire pressure and tire temp, because once he's given that position away, it's gonna be very difficult to get it back. And he's got someone directly behind him who wants to get back into the lead of this race, Michael Andretti. Michael is right there. We mentioned the damage on Jimmy Vassar. That occurred on the first lap, the opening lap incident. Carpentier takes a run off into one of the runoff areas. All the cars do have to carry by the rules reverse gear when they're running on a road course. And Carpentier uses it and goes back to the fight. Carpentier was running 15th. And if they go down those runoff areas, there's a set of cones to delineate where it's safe for the driver to back up under his own power. If he goes any further, then he has to be assisted by the course workers to be reversed and sent back out. I wonder if that wasn't another one of those throttle things, because it seemed like he knew he was in trouble way, way down the course. Well, he's got Cristiano D'Amato looking down the inside of him here. He's trying to, trying to defend the position, but the problem, Paul, he's right on the crown of the road. The car can get high-centered, lock up the wheels. You have no control. Jan Vikas. Castro Neves getting his service. Of course, the lone home of the Pesky team right now. Nine seconds and counting. Stay clear. Oh, that's the best one so far. 10.6 for Castro Neves. Pesky cars are both situated in the last two pits before the pit exit. So now Castro Neves coming out as the field comes by, finds himself in the same situation of trying to keep cold tires working while he has Oriol Servia, who stopped two laps ago on tires that are up at operating temperature, working him very hard. And Servia finally gets past him. 
You would never know these guys. Whoa, oh, baby, I can get a turn. Low tire pressure. They're cold oh. there, Elio. He pulled off line, though. He's pulled totally off the line. And it looked like the right side wheel had hiked up off the ground as he turned in there. I'm trying to see if all the tires are up and they're secure on the car. The left rear on the rear okay, shot we can't see. looked like it might not have a full, full load of air in it. Look. Well, he and Oriole banged wheels a little bit. Jan Bikas. According to the team, current officials have come over and told them there was contact with Serbia and they do have damaged suspension. We expect to see Castro Neves back here on pit road. So that's two Penske cars with contact and rear range suspension. Now the, the focus is on that left, left rear. rear. Make it around here. It, and it works on the going. diagonal. You can see it. It's definitely gone flat now. He's, he's completely lost that left rear. It works on the diagonal. As that goes down, it'll hike up that right front tire. And I was about to say it looked like you could, couldn't tell that these guys were driving open wheel cars they, the way they were leaning on each other. But this is one of the reasons why you can't get away with that. So another one of the contenders in the championship, Elio Castroneves, finds himself in trouble. And another contender in the championship with the last of the stops now complete for the first cycle of stops, Kenny Breck, the new rookie of the year, is in front. So Kenny Breck brings himself into this fight as the leader of the race. There's a roof for you. The country where the kangaroos bounce everywhere. They'll race you down the highway, race trains down the track. We'll be back. Sunday afternoon, the Indy Racing League Championship comes down to the last race. Buddy Lazier and Scott Goodyear will battle for the Northern Light Cup. Sunday afternoon, 4 o'clock Eastern, 1 Pacific on ABC Sports. The battle take place on the high banks of Texas Motor Speedway. There's a fine battle going on in Surfers Paradise, Australia. Paul Tracy has now managed to work his way up to fifth place. Kenny Breck is the leader, but the fuel strategy is at play. Jan Bikas? Well, an update on Castro Neves. The tire is back here on pit road. If you look carefully, you see some green paint mark here. It turned out there was not suspension damage for Castro Neves, but of course, green that is the color of Oreo Servi. It appears as though his wing or side of the car cut the tire, and that's the result. Now, normally when you see those tires, you want to see a, a slightly convex shape, and the left rear was uh, almost straight across, which is not the shape you wanted to see. That indicated to us that the tire had, in fact, had a problem, and then it started to shred itself on the way back in, but Catherine Evans was able to get it to the pit, and fortunately it didn't do a lot of damage. Paul Tracy continues on the charge. That is fourth place, Adrian Fernandez, just ahead of him. Adrian, another one of the contenders in this championship as they came into the race this weekend. With the variance in pit strategy right now, and when they've pitted, of course, Paul Tracy moved up as the leaders came in. I think I'm most impressed with, you notice they got by Shinji Nakano a number of laps ago, but Shinji has been hanging on the entire time, working with Paul coming up through the field. Tagliani Baron. Again, the fuel strategy. Different people stopping at different times, having an impact on the overall order. We expect Kenny Breck to come in on lap 38, so about seven, eight laps from now. With 65 laps, the scheduled distance just over 181 miles. The championship fight in full play. DeFerrin out of it for this race but still the points leader as they set now with Paul Tracy in second place and Adrian Fernandez who just in front of up in front of Tracy on the track well that's Adrian sitting there in third in the points at this moment Fernandez started 17th currently fourth the Pat Patrick team the last number of races have has had a lot of problems qualifying but yet when the race starts, these cars have worked very, very well. Jim McGee leading that team with fuel strategy has gotten them off strategy. They posted some good results. But it's been very frustrating for the drivers and the entire team not to be able to start up at the front in order to get the most out of these cars. The corner workers here have been alerted to keep an eye on Christian Fittipaldi. They thought they saw some spray at the back of the car. 
Paul Tracy's car working particularly well under braking. Doesn't come off the corner quite as well as Adrian's been coming off. Paul being very aggressive on the brakes. Very quick through these two chicanes down the pit straight. Tarso Marquez got in trouble, had a quick spin, didn't hit anything, was able to continue on. Marquez is running 22nd. We'll see Paul down at the back section of the course going through turns three and four. We'll close right up on Adrian. He just can't get close enough to make a pass stick coming off the final corner going on to the back straightaway. What plenty of traffic there for Paul Tracy to work. Fisherman on the beach here on the Gold Coast of Australia. You see why everybody likes it so much? Welcome back to Surfers Paradise Australia. Paul Page with Parker Johnstone, Gary Gerald, Jan Vikas are in the pits. Nothing's changed in the last few laps with the exception that now the course workers have been alerted to watch both of the Newman Haas cars, both Michael Andretti and Kristen Fittipaldi, for possible spray at the back of the car. Mentioned a little earlier, Michael Andretti already had a gearbox problem this weekend. And as we've been watching these cars, including Paul Tracy, Michael Andretti normally very aggressive over the curbs here at Surfers. These guys now, as we now just past the halfway point, are being very careful with the curbs. We saw Michael up on the curb, Christian a little farther down, watching Paul Tracy staying almost completely off the curbs because the gearboxes have been so fragile all year long to say nothing of suspension components and other related parts hanging in the side pods and onto the engine. Andretti and Fittipaldi currently run 10th and 11th behind 9th place Jimmy Vassar, that three-car battle there. Michael's problem, while certainly gearbox related, was, was more shift linkage related. Car locked in gear, he couldn't get it out of gear. And when they got it into the pits, they worked on it just a little bit and finally got linkage going. So it's not like he had a gearbox that went to pieces on it. This place is so bumpy, even down the straightaways, the cars really take a pounding. Drivers have to be very, very careful with the equipment here. And we have seen during the course of the season a lot of mechanical failures, much more than we would have ever suspected considering the amount of testing and preparation that these teams have. Kenny Breck, the leader. There's Pagliani, second place. Now remember, neither of those guys have raced here. Well, that certainly didn't stop Kenny Breck right from the initial green flag on Friday morning. He just took off. We've seen that so many times this year. He tries to play the, the rookie card a little bit, saying, well, gee, it's my first time at the circuit. And that guy drives so hard every single lap. And within a handful of laps, he was right at the top of the charts. Luis Garcia, Jr., currently 21st. Routine and away. laps let's start to think about this this halfway point in the race and how this fuel strategy plays to the end it's going to make for an interesting length of lap 60 through 65 I would think that's Jason Bright and the crowd here has been particularly partial to him cheering him on every time he does anything at all as one would expect hometown boy He's been on the podium five times so far this year in Indy Lights. He used to live just three miles south of the circuit until this year when he moved to the States to run in Indy Lights for the Doricott Racing Team. Sponsored by the government here in Australia to the tune of $300,000 Australia, $300, Australian. It's good work if you can get it. I think any time the government pays your way, that's a very, very good thing. Breck Tagliani Baron, top three. It'll change. Tracy kind of plateaued behind Adrian Fernandez at fifth place. This car, Jason Bright, races, of course, John Della Pinnis, based as so many of the champ car teams are in Indianapolis, Indiana. In fact, uh, most of them in probably a three-square-mile area. 
most of these teams will end up going to lunch at many of the same places. Which then in turn makes for some fascinating lunchtime conversation. No fist fights reported yet. I've been watching the quickest laps. Alex Tagliani consistently very quick. And his teammate, Patrick Carpante, down in 17th place. The fastest car on the track now consistently turning laps nearly a full second faster than anyone else. Patrick Carpentier, who, who does still, this is of course Tagliani, but Patrick Carpentier, who still looks for his first win. Carso Marquez lets Tagliani through. One of those drivers who looks for a seat next year. A lot of indication that he will get something. He certainly is deserving and can probably give whoever will pick him up an excellent ride next year. Kenny Breck on the pit road. So again, the fuel strategy starts to work, Jan? Yes, it does. And of course, under anytime you stop under green, time is so, so important in these stops. But they will wait for every bit of fuel. If we watch the top, wait for fuel to go in the pit hose. How's that for rims? 13.3. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, this is a lot of fun. You this like cool. that one, eh, yeah, Jan? I do. And Tagliani's <laughs> going to be here in a second. Roberto Moreno is in. Gary? Perfectly hitting the marks. Moreno right there. They're not expecting any changes on the car, even though in the last five laps, Roberto has said the car has been loose under braking, waiting for the fueling to be completed as they pass 11, now 12 seconds. He starts to roll, hesitates, now gets rolling. He lost a couple of seconds, and he may have lost a position. Somebody went by. It could have been Max Pappas on That's exactly road. who it was. Max Pappas got a nose in front of Moreno. Moreno came in from 10th. Tagliani picks up the lead, but... Look, they may have carried him too far on fuel. He's shaking the car, trying to get fuel to come down into the engine. Alex Barron was in second place. Oh, he is way, way, way far away from the pit. And he's decided, apparently, he's too far away. Reports are now the we engine is off. Tag. We ran out of fuel. Alex Timmerman. And you've got to be so careful here. Only Elkhart Lake is longer for any of the courses that it's fed. Oh, here's Mark Blundell stopped in the middle of the course. That the FedEx cars go to, the drivers have a digital readout to know how much fuel is left in the car, but that's if the car's picking up everything it says it has left in the tank. Mark Blundell wants help. He wants somebody to get out there, get him going again, and showing his frustration that it's not happening. Down the inside of Max Pappas here. Max, I guess, didn't know he was there. But the funny thing is Mark didn't complete the turn. That's what I find so surprising. He snapped it around and stalled it. Gary Gerald. Adrian Fernandez is in for service. Paul Tracy just rolled in in front of him. He's four pips up the line. Here goes Fernandez. We'll keep an eye on Tracy. He gets out in front of Barron. They both beat Tracy out. Tracy rolls routinely. Tear away gone for Paul Tracy as he makes his stop. Fernandez comes cleanly back into the traffic alongside of Carpentier, but again, the cold tires. There was Alex Barron. And now Paul Tracy gets through. Fernandez, everything that they had in the pit stop, Tracy was hoping to make up. He takes care of on the way out of the pits. I'm surprised now, Paul, that Fernandez has dropped so far back. Well, they came into the pits with Tracy as the leader. Going to the uh, to the stops by Breck and for that matter Baron and the problem then with Tagliani with Fernandez right behind him but you see that Tracy came out of the pits and was immediately able to at least make the position on Fernandez that's Carpentier that sits just ahead of him and so we'll see where this thing's going to go there's a croc remember Crocodile Dundee well that's actually one of them no further comment necessary of Australia is being brought to you today by Intershop, building e-commerce applications that help you sell in ways your competitors can't. By Outback Steakhouse, no rules, just right. And by Toyota, more choices, better selection. Experience Toyota today. 
Well, this time quite a bit happened while we were away. Cindy Nakano had a fire pulled off. Then Michael Andretti, remember they were looking at him for spray or talking about bringing him in. And he suddenly had a fire in the back, ran it off the course. His brakes failed as he went off the course. And that's most likely a result of this fire we see in the back as it goes through the, the brake lines here. Michael out of the car very quickly. Safety crew right on the scene extinguishes the flames. So Michael Andretti's championship bid may in fact be in very serious jeopardy now. Jill DeFerrin would still lead the points followed by Adrian and Kenny Breck. The full course caution flags are out. The pits at the moment are closed until the field is gathered up behind the pace car. That might take a little bit because the field is also pretty well strung out. I swear this is the championship no one seems to want to win. The only person out on the track now that's got a chance of really strengthening his position going into Fontana is Paul Tracy, who's currently in ninth place. So a lot of action that uh, can, in fact, change the championship once again down in Surfer's Paradise, Australia. The crowd's getting their money's worth today. This FedEx delivery segment focuses on the difficulties of transporting all of the needed equipment overseas for the race in Australia. Three FedEx MD-11s are loaded up with $70 million worth of equipment on board. 50 race cars, two safety trucks, one pace car, and over 1,200 Firestone tires. Each two-car team is allowed four race cars, four engines, eight toolboxes, two scoring stands, 35 fire suits, and the other necessities to fully compete on a race weekend. Well, in Surface Paradise, Australia, we do expect stops. We expect a good many of them as soon as they bring the field around to the pit straight itself. It took a few minutes to get the field actually closed up behind the pace car. There they go through the turn 11 and 12 complex, and that'll bring them onto the pit straight. Interesting, uh, interesting configuration, lower left-hand corner there. That's uh, one of the sky boxes and it is built over the racetrack. Can you imagine the view that some of those folks have? Now, the pits are still closed, despite the fact that they do have the field pretty well gathered up. So it'll be another full lap before they come in. Well, you can see there, there is, in fact, an interval, and now the remainder of the field actually sliding in, so they have another full lap to go before they'll be able to come in. Jan Vikas? Well, there's been some high-fiving going on down here in Jimmy Vassar's pit. Because the pits are still closed, they get one more lap around the racetrack, meaning that this stop that they take will mean they'll make it to the end on fuel, exactly what they wanted. The Jimmy Vassar's crew waits. It's not a totally good assumption that everybody, though, will make it to the end of the race. There's the view from back in the hinterland out to Surfer's Paradise. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Surfer's Paradise, Australia. Of course, Luis Garcia Jr. continues to soldier in there and continues to lead in the Budweiser Hard Charger Award. This was Michael. And with that runoff, it ended his race. It also finally numerically ended any chance of a championship. So Michael Andretti and Juan Montoya, part of the nine that started, are now out of the championship fight. And next time by Parker, we expect the entire field to come in as we uh, give you the race recap at this point. Well, that's Here at Surfers Paradise, uh, you may see that entire field hit the pitch. I would think they would have to, Paul, because at this point they can go to the end. This will be the final stop. It's not going to be easy, but we should see everyone coming into the pits right now. But you know, the interesting thing is guys that have a lot of fuel on board, like Paul Tracy, will take no tires, just a splash, and it'll be ultra fast on pit road. This is interesting. It's, it's not going to be everybody. Jan Bikas. Well, we wait for the leader, Jimmy Vassar. He's going to have to go around the tires of Tony Kanan. He does so successfully. Now, he'll need a fair bit of fuel because this was perfect for him and his timing. We look for people going by. Let's go to Gary and watch Christian. Tracy's already gone. Tracy's beaten Fittipaldi, and he may have beaten Vassar out as well. Well, Vassar got beat by all kinds of guys, Gary. And you saw, there's Tracy, and you saw Fittipaldi come by 
shortly thereafter, and then finally Jimmy Vassar was able to roll. Hmm. I talked to the Firestone guys this morning, and Jan, I think you're absolutely right. They said this is the same tire compound they use at Vancouver. They said if someone wanted to double stint a set of tires, it would be no problem. Yeah, and I also think it was a situation where Jimmy Vassar took all the fuel, took four tires, what you might call a conservative pit stop. The other guys gambled and picked up all kinds of track position. I would say that was a smart move. And unlike we suggested, there were a number of cars that did stay out. They are now effectively in front of the race. Luis Garcia Jr. is actually the guy lined up directly behind the pace car right now. So they should go back uh, very shortly to green flag. Cows in the pasture, more of the beautiful, beautiful sights here in Australia. After four consecutive defeats at the hands of the Titans, the Jaguars are looking for revenge. Can Jacksonville break the spell? Or will Steve McNair and the Titans continue to dominate? It's Jacksonville versus Tennessee on Monday Night Football Live at 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific on ABC Sports. Welcome back to Surfers Paradise Australia. I'm Paul Page with Parker Johnstone. Uh, they're not racing. Blundell's just trying to keep with them. The green flag should come out from this full course caution at the end of this lap. And they will be lined up Fernandez, Barron, Moreno, Pappas, Bright, Breck. That's the top six. Then come Tracy and Fittipaldi, Jimmy Vassar, and Cristiano D'Amata. The big gamble here by Pat Patrick. He did not bring his cars in on that last stop. They have got six laps fewer remaining in the tank than anyone else. That's going to be a real stretch to get to the end unless this becomes a timed race or we have additional yellow before the checkered flag. And Parker, back before that round of stops, the Patrick team was estimating they were going to be about four laps short on fuel. They needed yellow. We'll try to update and see where they stand now. Luis Garcia Jr. and Mark Blundell trying to catch up to the field so they can take the green flag with them. They went underneath the starter stand and Mark Blundell finally has decided apparently uh, I hope that was a radio communication. No I think to do it. I think Garcia just missed the corner Paul and Mark said fine thanks I'll see you later I need to get to the back of this field before we go green. The field itself works its way down through the Esplanade chicane and the left hander brings them back in between the buildings a series of turns that turn them further left and finally back onto the pit straight. Well, once again, it's come down to fuel strategy. The guys at Pat Patrick taking a risk. It's come good for them many, many times in the past. They've brought their cars up now. Remember, Fernandez qualified back in 17th. Roberto Moreno back in 20th. Those two cars currently first and third, and they are still alive in the championship. This may be absolutely brilliant, not only for today's race, but for the championship itself. And Parker, if we can interject, just checking with the team for Pat Patrick Racing, the drivers who are first and third, they still need more yellow. They're getting it by the moment. Right now, they're figuring they're about two and a half laps short of what they need oh, to go, oh, 65. Oh, Moreno! Moreno lost it coming out of the last corner onto the pit straight. He stood on the throttle. The car went left. He couldn't get it back. And that's the yellow that Adrian Fernandez was looking for. Just he didn't want it at the expense of his teammate. Alex Barron almost lost it in front of him. Now watch Barron in the orange and white car. He catches it, and then Moreno loses it in exactly the same place. It might have been a little slick spot there. Well, you've got to keep in mind, both of those cars powered by the same sort of engine, both coming up onto the power at about the same place. Barrett modulated the throttle, got control of it, no problem. Moreno just got away from him, turned him right into the wall on the inside. Jason Bright makes his stop, and... Uh, and he's killed it, Paul, for now, yeah, trying to get a refire. There's Jim McGee. So, uh, once again, McGee has uh, tried to figure the game out. He is so good. You know, one of those, if you want to use the, the tried and true trite, wily old veterans who really knows the strategy of racing. Jim McGee is certainly one of those. But Paul, how many owners have we talked to that base all their pit strategy on what Jim McGee does? They don't watch anybody else on the track. They just watch what Pat Patrick and Jim McGee do in the pits. Right now, with that move, Adrian Fernandez would move into second in the championship. The Australians show their appreciation for 
Gold Coast native Jason Bright. That's why they call it Surfer's Paradise right there. We'll be back with more. We're under full course caution once again. Well, the twin yellow flags continue to fly at the starter stand. It is uh, continuing as a full course caution while they get the debris from Roberto Moreno's car, who really caught the wall pretty good. Barron had saved it and kept going, and then Moreno wasn't able to do it. Watch the third car in a row there. There's Barron's loss of it, and then Moreno, once he lost it, it almost climbed the wall. And as we watch it uh, again from another angle, a couple of things to consider. Paul Tracy was right there. Might have had a problem with debris from the accident. See, Tracy almost had to chalk the brakes to keep from getting into the back of Kenny Breck. We are at a point here where this race may, in fact, well, Breck certainly got a bunch of debris. We're at a point where this may become a timed race before the whole thing is over. And Alex Barron sitting there in second place. Remember, the first race here was won by John Andretti, his only win in a champ car. Gary? Checking with uh, Kim and Barry Green for Paul Tracy. Asked if there was concern about debris. They said they thought they were okay. They said from what they saw, they thought that Breck got most of the debris. They also were asking them about if they think this will become a timed race, and they're sharing that information with the crew. Looks like it may well come down to that. Well, according to my calculations right now, we've got 19 laps to go, but we can only get 17, maybe 18 laps more in before we hit the two-hour time limit. And so interesting that uh, Mon uh, the, uh, the accident involving Moreno may work very definitely to the advantage of his teammate, Fernandez. Jason Bright, you saw him climb out of the car. Thoughts at the conclusion of his first ride in the champ cars, John? Well, first of all, you did have a bird's eye view of what happened to those cars ahead of you. Was there a slick spot or something? No, I think it was just cold tires. You know, everybody was sort of a little bit loose out of there, and, and Roberto, unfortunately, got, tur got turned himself around, and um, he was basically heading right over the left-hand left -hand side, and I, I knew that he might then bounce back out, but I thought if we both stay on it, we're, you know, we're, we're going to get through, and um, I didn't expect Max to hit the brakes. I was too busy looking, looking at Roberto, and I didn't realize Max has hit the brakes so hard. So it, it's disappointing for the guys here. You know, we, we've got a lot of support this weekend from Bud, Skilled, and, and Gillette, and, um, you know, it's, it's disappointing for Della Pena. It was a great ride. Congratulations on what was for a while a great ride. Yeah, thanks, John. So Jason Bright, uh, he finds himself out a little bit prematurely. Again, this country has just absolutely incredible natural beauty. Full course caution. We'll be back. The all. Back at Surfers Paradise, Australia on the beautiful Gold Coast, Gary Gerald. With Roberto Moreno. Roberto, tell us what happened here as you're anticipating getting back up to speed. Basically, um, I had to save a lot of fuel. I couldn't uh, warm the tires up uh, because to make to the end, we could have made it. Um, coming out of the corner, just uh, the tires a bit too cold, uh, lightened up when the turbo came in. I couldn't hold it. As far as the championship is concerned, does this seal your fate, or are you still going to be optimistic going into this last race at Fontana? Well, we're going to try everything we, we can, like we did here. We came from the back. We all lay up to the front. Uh, the Vision team did, again, a great strategy work. Unfortunately, um, I wasn't up to it today. So uh, it, didn't, it wasn't meant to be. Uh, we're certainly going to come back stronger the next race, uh, and also next year somehow. Um, so um, it, it has been a great season for me. Uh, the Vision team has done a great job to put me up front there. Uh, I'm fighting with, on, on the championship to this point um, against drivers that have a lot more experience in this game than I have. Thank you. We're back, Green. Green flag just comes out. Look at Paul Tracy weave left and right, and we got trouble again. This time it's Pappas. And Tracy's trying to get by. Oh, I want to see the officials sort that one out. Well, we saw Pappas and Breck go side by side with Tracy weaving in behind them. We did see Servia take the escape route again. He's very, very good at that. And look at the interval that created. Here it is again. Pappas losing it behind Kenny Breck. Tracy darts his way through, and then Pappas comes sliding out in front of him. You saw the back end kind of jump there, like Tracy may in fact have hit it. 
Well, we don't know if Max had contact from behind on the way in there. I would assume he did, but right now, Tracy, very, very fortunate to have gotten through there relatively unscathed. Oh! Whoa. Paul says, yeah, whatever. Grass, curb, sky, doesn't make any difference. Now look, Oriole coming back. Oriole Servia comes to the outside of Tracy. Here they come. Oh! oh. And Servia takes Tracy out! Nobody wants to win this championship, Paul. Paul Tracy had done everything that he could, and then battling with Oriole Servia. And we've seen many times this year, Servia just never gives up. And remember, guys, that Servia, by the rules, should have given Tracy that position back much earlier than that. Well, that's exactly it. Paul Tracy, thankfully, is okay. Now, you can see Servia just got up over the curb, had lost directional control at that point. Paul doing what he's supposed to. He's online where he needs to be. Servia spears him, puts him right into the wall. Paul now, I think, waiting for Servia to come around to uh, give a little hand to cockpit communication. And Adrian Fernandez is saying thank you so much for playing my game. I'm wondering, you know, they're, they're, the nose now is totally destroyed, so we won't know, but it looks to me at this point like Tracy does already have some damage on the car. But this is the point that, that Jan was making. We saw Serbia go through, we saw Cristiano D'Amata go through, and rightfully, Serbia had to give that position exactly. back. Now watch, Paul's still online. We can see Serbia and his teammate Cristiano D'Amata go through. I can't quite tell who of that other car was that was in between. It looks like Luis Garcia Jr., perhaps. So at that point, he's got to get out of it. We can see Paul into the back of Max Pappas there on the way in. So we know what started that. Max, very fortunate not to have heavier contact there. Well, the jump that I saw in the rear of the car was actually Max bringing the back end down off of the curbing. Right. So, I mean, by all rights, Servia should have pulled over, given the, that that position back to Paul, but instead he just spears Paul coming into the back chicane right there. Big contact for Paul Tracy. Paul Tracy is a big guy. Maybe the biggest guy in the series. Servia may be the second smallest in the series. Let's keep them separated in the pits. Well, this would make a great WWF smackdown, that's for sure. And guys, there's a conversation taking place behind the pit wall. Kim Green has come down and is talking with uh, the Cal Wells PPI team. Now Kim heads off toward his support garage paddock area, but another championship contender has fallen by the wayside. And but within the championship itself, Jill DeFerrin, as they would finish right now, still is going to go away from here with 153. That's a given. Adrian Fernandez is currently in second place in that championship. Paul Tracy is still sitting in third place in the championship, followed by Kenny and then Roberto Moreno, uh, who is, is still right on the edge of the fight. We'll see, we have to get to the end of the race to find out. And then two, timed event. Two hours is the rule. It looks like they're gonna shift this to a timed event very shortly. Her official notification comes from race control with just 10 minutes to go, but what a most unusual day here in beautiful surfer's paradise. They're gonna talk about this one for a long time, and we'll be back hopefully with another restart in just a moment. Surfer's paradise, still full course caution, the current standings with Fernandez on his way to a potential victory. Of course, all these laps of full course caution playing into that whole fuel strategy game of Adrian Fernandez. Jan Vikas. With a very disappointed Barry Green, obviously. You saw the replays on the big screen. Your take on it. Well, I mean, you know, a restart, tough place to pass, and I think Paul and Max might have gotten together to start it all. And, and uh, you know, I don't know what exactly happened uh, after that, but uh, you know, Serbia certainly finished him off. Um, tough day, you know, just really fighting an uphill battle. We had something go, go wrong with the throttle cable earlier on, and um, that put him out, out of, off the track and out of the lead, and then it's been a fight all the way back, and uh, I think it would have been, uh, it's too bad, we would have made some good points and, and, and still been in a strong position going into Fontana in a couple of weeks. Not out of it yet, but, uh, you know, obviously it's made it a lot harder. 
But the way this race went, you must still have some hope for Fontana because now we know anything truly can happen. Oh, let me tell you, never, never count Team Cool Green out. I, we got one race, we got a bunch of points there, and uh, you know our cars are very fast there. So uh, we'll be back a couple of weeks fighting hard. Thank you, Gary. Gary, Max Pappas back in his uh, paddock area. This has been a season of so much frustration for you. Here's another incident when it looks like you've got an opportunity for one of your best finishes. Do you have any idea what happened when you got hit from behind? Not really. No. This year, you know, it's really tough for the Miller guys. We've been doing a very good job today. The car was running very well. You know, it was good enough to finish in the top two or three, but uh, looks like this year there is something bad. I don't know. Every, everything wrong can happen. It happened to us there. Yeah. Well, hopefully, one race to go. It'll somehow get better. He won the season opener. Maybe he wins the season ender. Well, they're going to move Servia back in the field. They're going to move him back behind seventh place Cristiano D'Amata. Uh, some of us are surprised it's, it's not a more severe penalty than that. But they're moving him because he gained an advantage during those passes that culminated in the accident involving Paul Tracy. We'll be back right after these messages. World coverage of the Kart Grand Prix of Australia has been brought to you by Honda, proud sponsor of the 2000 FedEx Championship Series. By FedEx, proud sponsor of the FedEx Championship Series. And by Bridgestone, a grip on the future. We're waiting for the green flag to come out. The field formed up behind Adrian Fernandez. Uh, remember the next and final race? There's Jill DeFerrin who was out on the very first lap, but still leads the championship points watching the remainder of this race. Remember that Adrian Fernandez won a year ago at Fontana, the next and final race of the season. Coverage on ESPN is just two weeks from now at California Speedway. Gary? Interesting radio conversation that pertains to the silly season and all the talk about who drives where next year. Cal Wells to Oriel Serbia. After Serbia gets that penalty that sets him back in the order, now behind his teammate in car number 97, Damata. Oriel is told he's driving for someone else next year. You do what you have to do. Draw your own conclusions. Whoa, Serbia. wow. <laughs> yeah, oh, baby. Ah, uh, no bitterness here. Fernandez, the great story behind Fernandez is going to be Barron. Green flag comes out. And look at, at the jump he got on Barron. Barron battles with Breck. He punched Breck to the right. <laughs> All right, how are you going to call that one, Parker? Oh, uh, well, back to you, Paul. <laughs> oh. Well, I, you know, Breck did pick up the advantage. He actually did the pass over there, don't you think? Well, he had about a wheel ahead on the way in, but there was no place for him to go on the turn in. Be interesting to review that. Yeah, oh, Demata, Demata tried to get in there, locked the brakes up, can't do it. There's a huge problem going down there. It's easy to get on the crown of the road. The car bottoms, it's impossible to use the brakes there. Race control is now saying to the teams on their radio frequency that Barron needs to be let back into second place by Kenny Breck. Part of the problem with that, look, at there goes Fernandez. Jordan lights him up. He just let him by, but and there it is. But remember, the radio and telemetry communications aren't that good with all the built-up area and tall fences here. Just before they made the right-hander, Kenny Breck did have a wheel on him. As they turned in, though, they were side-by-side. -side. Breck got the advantage through the chicane. He had to let him go back through, but now oh, look at More pushing and shoving back there with Fittipaldi. And look at Serbia. Banner coming off of Vassar's car. We've only got, according to my watch here, Paul, about oh, 11 minutes left. This is going to time out because there are 14 laps left in the race. We won't complete all 65. It will be a timed event. And these drivers know they've got to try to get those passes done now before the field strings out. Fernandez finally leading some laps under green now. Eric's Alex Barron having the second best drive of his career. Of his career. Remember a couple of years ago, he took the Dan Gurney Eagle chassis to the lead at Vancouver. Fantastic run there. And also for Dale Coyne. Remember their best finish was second. 
US 500 several years ago with Roberto Moreno driving. Great drive for Barron and for Dale Coin Racing. Race control has just made it official. There are 10 minutes left in this race. It will be a timed race. All bunched together here and now the closing laps of the race. Fernandez. Alex Barron still in pursuit. What a day is it going to be for Dale Coyne if he can stay there. And right now, the battle at the front is Ford, 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 Toyota, Toyota. Fernandez, Barron, and Breck, first, second, and third, and then the Toyota of Serbia, the Toyota of Vassar. Serbia being extremely aggressive once again. We've seen him do this. As the season has gone on, he's gotten more comfortable in the car. Very, very impressive. Now look at Cristiano D'Amato right oh. up behind the back of Jimmy Vassar. Yellow just ahead. We're not sure what that one's for. Serbia still very aggressive. And D'Amato now coming in to work hard, hard on Jimmy Vassar. And this track has had the same sort of history of Cleveland, Detroit, where the last few laps in the closing moments, all sorts of very strange things happen. And Surfers is living up to that reputation once again. Except it didn't wait for the closing laps. It no. started in turn one. Yeah, it got an early start this year. Cristiano still working on Jimmy Vassar as hard as he can. And that yellow, Paul, we've got a report that it was Christian Fittipaldi down the escape road. Everyone should be good on fuel. Oriel Servi again. Once again, locking brakes, going in extremely deep. See the same for Mauricio Guzman. Nobody's going to have any brunch left by the end of this thing. Well, they've only got a few laps left at this point. It is just a flat-out sprint race. Every lap is qualifying now. What a good and interesting run this has been. And its effect on the overall championship, taking it to the last race of the season at California Speedway. Oh, baby. And remember, a 500-mile race for champ cars. Kind of anybody's guess past the 200th mile. There's just so many things that can happen there. So many things that can affect the outcome of the race, as opposed to, say, a 200 miler or something at that approximate distance. Oh, you can see Cristiano D'Amata trying to look down the inside, but he's got the same problem. As I've said many times, the roads are severely crowned here. If you get out to the middle to try to look down the inside, the car literally bottoms, becomes a big skateboard. The wheels come off the ground, you lock the brakes. At some point, you have no directional control of the car either, and you just become a passenger until the car comes off the ground and you can regain traction. Look at Alex Barron, Paul, though, holding position. Oh, no, he's, he's slow, he Paul. He slows down. Barron suddenly slows down right at the pit exit. Brick goes to second place. Oh, what could that be? What? Oh, Alex Barron, so deserving. Replaces Takuya Kurosawa in this car, originally assigned to it for the season, but then Kurosawa was injured, had a back injury. Gary Gerald? Paul, it's so ironic. I had just asked Dale Coyne that we'd had a report on possible smoke from the car. Was it bottoming? He said, no. He smiled, patted me on the head, and said, no, we're fine. Was it five seconds later, you made the call. Now they're confirming it's a motor and engine problem. He is done. And the reason that that car is at an angle to the wall is Alex was simply trying to get it offline, trying to turn back around into the pit out so that they didn't have to go full course yellow. He just didn't quite get it turned all the way. And they had also told him just prior to that that he could use the overtake button. It was a time race, do anything he could to challenge Fernandez. What a shame. I mean, we've seen that now. Carpentier, Max Pappas, even Alex Barron. Things going very wrong. Bad karma, bad luck. Here is one of the key battles now. Vassar and Serbia. The reason it is key because Jimmy Vassar needs to get around Serbia if he wants to stay alive in the championship fight. So Fernandez, Breck, Serbia, Vassar. Remember Jimmy won two weeks ago at Houston. A brilliant drive there. Serbia has been one of the most aggressive, one of the fastest car on the circuit all day long. Jimmy's got his work cut out from him, and occasionally he's under attack from behind by Cristiano D'Amata. I can tell you, Paul, if Serbia keeps locking those brakes, he's going to flat spot those tires to the point he will not be able to defend this position, but he's only got inside of about six minutes now to have to do that. And 
right behind Vassar with Damata, Carpentier, Castro Nevis. They're all there. And you could see that wasn't Jimmy looking to the inside of Serbia. That was Jimmy protecting his life from Damata from behind. Replay of Barron slowing down, coming down the pit straight. Kenny Breck, quick movement to the right to avoid him. Good bit of heads up driving by Alex to get it offline and out of the way here. Clock is counting with about four and a half minutes left to go on the run. It is a time break. And Jimmy Vassar just got Serbia. I remember the host broadcaster down here, 10 Australia. And because only one race a year, perhaps not as attuned to some of those situations. But now Vassar is still in the championship. And you'll watch but Vassar you, pull away now, Paul. What I want to watch is Damata and Serbia. Because I can tell you that Serbia's got to be out of tires. Gary Gerald. With Alex Barron making this long, disconsolate walk back to be so close to a podium finish, a possible victory, to have this motor problem, what are you experiencing right now? I almost hate to ask, but I have to. Uh, I'm lost for words. I don't, I don't really know what to say. I mean, uh, we had a really good car. We had a really good car today, and uh, the car was really comfortable. And uh, you know, it was just just a shame because the Sports Today car was running really good all weekend. And uh, I mean, we really needed this. And uh, for four and a half minutes to go to the end of the race and have that happen is just it's so discouraging. But just got to keep our heads up and going to Fontana. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, Cristiano Damata, maybe Serbia finally did wear those fronts out. Cristiano was able to get around him and is now pulling away. Carpentier is. Going to try to get Serbia next. Tarso Marquez tries to get everybody. Misses them all. Well, here's the pass. Jimmy Vassar down the inside of Serbia. Times it perfectly and sticks it. Leaves absolutely no doubt that he's got that pass done so that Oriole can't come back on him and put Jimmy into the fence. That was sweet. That was very pretty. That's, that's just nailing a pass there. It's exactly what you have to do. Jimmy Vassar, the winner of the street race at Houston two weeks ago, a man without a ride for next year. And yet he's here in the middle of the championship fight, sitting in third place. And the championship right now, we started with nine. There's still six actively left in the fight. And Paul, when things are going well for these guys, it's easy to find rides, easy to be on top of the world. The real trick in motor racing is being able to survive when things don't go well as Carpentier is going through, even Vassar at this point. He's definitely on the upswing. As you said, we've got DeFerrin at the top, Adrian in second, then a two-way tie between Tracy and Kenny, and then Roberto Moreno and Jimmy Vassar tied back on the next level. So it's anybody's fight right now. Kenny Breck, of course, looking for his first win in the series, already wrapped up the Rookie of the Year as Breck chases Fernandez. And next time by, the white flag should come out. Jim Swintel, the starter, just picks up the white flag, ready to present it to Adrian Fernandez when he comes around next time. Fernandez, Breck, Vassar, Damata. Vassar, with that third place, if he can keep it, stays in the championship fight. Fernandez won earlier in the year in Rio, but as you've said, Paul, significantly, remember, he won Fontana last year. That 500-mile race, eight pit stops, all kinds of things can happen. But Fernandez, this is huge for the Pat Patrick team. Great pit strategy. And the car, as it has so many times this year, working perfectly during the race, just not during qualifying. Of course, we are going to have the coverage of the 500 at California Speedway on ESPN just two weeks away now. Everybody will bring a calculator. Maybe even Parker will bring his old slide rule to try and keep track <laughs> of that championship. I'll bring a backup even. Adrian Fernandez is now being told with the white flag that there is a single lap between him and victory. Kenny Brack recognizes the white flag, one to go. That there is a single lap between him and his potential first victory. Things have happened so out of the ordinary at Surfers. Remember, it wasn't too long ago that we saw two white flags at Surfers Paradise. Hopefully, this will be the one and only. Oh, don't even, don't even, <laughs> don't go there. Sorry. Wreck is closing in. Ah, uh, there's no way at this point, I think, Paul. 
I mean, Kenny has driven just fantastically all weekend long. You can see Fernandez checking his left mirror, though. There is some concern there. But he's got to be closer than this, and then he's got to be able to pull off the pass. A little defensive driving here goes a long ways. I think Masters also safe in his position. Yeah, Another nope. fine run by Carpentier at this point. Now looking at the back of D'Amato. No contest there, Vassar, Damata, Carpentier, Castro, Nevis. Here is where the fight's going to be, and time and distance is running out. Already, Jim Swintel, the starter, has picked up the checkered flag. Kenny Breck is right there, but he's running out of opportunity. This will be the fourth podium of the year for the rookie champion. And if he's going to stick it, he's got to put it in right here, Paul. Coming into the final corner, turn 12. He's just got to dive bomb him, but he's not going to do it. Adrian Fernandez makes the turn, pit straight lines ahead, twin checkered flags. And now we can say he's done it. I was afraid to mention it until that car was definitely <laughs> over the line with the day we've had here. Pretty good job there for uh, not much front there on the right front. Good job, buddy. Good drive. Good drive. Adrian Fernandez takes the victory. Interesting race. It's Surfers Paradise Australia. The championship goes on to the California Speedway in two weeks. A 500 miler and anything as we know in the Kart FedEx Series can happen at a 500 mile distance. There are the current point standings. So the battle continues on and it is going to be a fight. No question about that owing to the time constraints of the race running long. We're not going to be able to talk with Adrian Fernandez. I can assure you he is going to be very, very happy. Two weeks, California Speedway, the 500. Coverage comes on ESPN. And don't forget, too, RPM tomorrow at noon. You'll hear all that Adrian Fernandez and the rest have to say. Sports Center is coming up next. Congratulations to Patrick Racing and Adrian Fernandez, the winner at Surfers Paradise. A lot more to...